Well, good morning and good day to you, and we welcome you here uh, to worship once again with Baldwin Christian Reformed Church. We are so glad uh, that you have decided to join us this day uh, as we have opportunity to praise our God. Uh, and once again, it, it's another beautiful Saturday uh, and hopefully a beautiful Sunday that God has given us uh, and that we praise him for his creation and for the work and, and the opportunities that he has given us. Uh, a special welcome today to our GEMS girls and their families. Uh, today was supposed to be our, our big annual GEM Sunday service, uh, and we're sad that we can't normally have it like that. Uh, I was really looking forward to it, uh, but we are still going to incorporate uh, a lot of the GEM Sunday stuff into this service on a smaller scale. Uh, and so we're going to hear uh, and sing a lot of the GEM songs. We're going to use a litany that uh, the GEMS organization has provided. Uh, we're going to hear the children's sermon uh, that some of the girls worked on. Uh, and hopefully carry through that theme in our service of loved, period. That is what we are. Uh, so certainly welcome to those of you young girls uh, and their parents who might be joining us today. As we come into this place and this time, I invite you to join me in hearing our call to worship. It comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, as we think about those familiar words, Lord, we love you and we praise you. That as they define different times in our lives, times when things are going well, times when things are not going so well, times of distress and times when you simply call us to, to walk with you when you call us to, to trust in you, when you call us to uh, pay attention to the work that you are doing. Uh, and Lord God, they certainly plant that vision in our minds of that which you are calling us home to, Lord God, that you have a reward for those who you love. Lord God, we give you all thanks and glory and praise that you have made these things true for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that you would be exalted in this day, that you would be exalted in our time together. Uh, and Lord God, uh, that our hearts would be drawn closer to you in faith and in love and in hope. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. And so as we come into this place and this time, let's join together in singing. We'll start with open up the heavens and then one thing remains.
Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in trial and the change this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me, your love. And on and on and on and on it goes, yes it overwhelms and satisfies my soul, and I'm there. going to do our gems litany um, and it's based on our loved period theme so I will do the leader role and we ask everyone out there to be the all congregation and my gems girls you know your part when it says gems please join us and the girls will help you God is love it's who he is it's what he does 
He loves us with an unfailing, unending, and unconditional love. Jesus loves me, this I know. No matter how I feel, what I've done, or what others say about me, I am loved, period. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. 1 John 3, 1. When we receive God's great love and become part of his family, everything changes. We learn whose we are and who we are. We discover our true identity. We are called, called children of God, and that is what we are. Our identity is not in our roles or reputation, weaknesses or strengths, achievements or appearances, or what we own or do. Our true identity and new identity is found in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5.17 In Jesus, we are accepted, beautiful, forgiven, and loved. When we remember who we really are in Jesus, we will live loved, period. From the fullness of God's love, we will love him, ourselves, and others. Gracious God, thank you for your great love for us. Give us the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus, so we can live loved. Through your love for us, May the world come to know that Jesus loves them, too. In his life-changing name, amen. John 3 verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I say yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sins, let his little child come and sing. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, this I know when I say yes. Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Every now and then when you feel like you are on your own, sing this song and remember you are never all alone, cause Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, this I know when I say yes. Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, this I know when I say yes. Jesus loves me, yes. 
Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. Our Lord God and Father, we give you thanks that you have given us that promise, you have given us that truth and that guarantee that you do love us. Lord God, that's not something that we just feel, that's not something that we just make up for ourselves, but but as the, the old song says, we believe it because the Bible tells us so. Lord God, we know it. We don't have to question it. That as we go through this life, as we go through the the, the joys and and the celebrations, as well as the the trials and the crises, Lord God, as we continue to to think about them this morning, uh, Lord God, we root ourselves uh, by faith through the grace of your Son, Jesus, uh, in your love. Lord God, that love carries into our lives the, the understanding that you have changed us, that you have and that you are making us new. We take that love into our future to know, Lord God, that, that you have saved us for eternal life. We take that love into our lives to know uh, that it is you who gives us our value. Lord God, no matter what happens around us, no matter what happens to us, no matter what others say against us, We are precious and loved by you. Lord God, I pray that that just wouldn't be the theme that that our Gems girls take and that their leaders take, but that each and every one of us, as men and women, boys and girls alike, Lord God, that we would know your precious love. It is because you love us, O God, that we do come before you this morning with, uh, with our concerns, with our cares and with our pleas that you would come and move. Lord God, as we think about those who are preparing for surgery, uh, as we think about Jim Bonte, Lord, and we give you thanks for uh, the surgery that he had last fall, and yet we pray uh, that you would be with him going forward. Uh, Lord God, as he has to have scar tissue dealt with in the next month, Lord God, we pray uh, that that complication uh, would be healed. Lord God, would you be with him? Lord God, we think of of the many in our country and in our world who uh, are dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Lord God, who are sick, who are fatigued, and uh, Lord God, while there are many healthy, and we give you all the glory and praise that that you have granted health, uh, Lord God, we pray for healing. We pray for your presence to be known among those who are struggling. Lord God, we think not just about people this morning, but we think also Uh, about organizations, uh, about parachurch ministries and different camp ministries, uh, for music festivals, Lord God, as we think also about One Fest in in Chippewa Falls that's been scheduled for this summer. As we think about Rocky Mountain High, the the event for the youth in in, uh, in Estes Park, Lord God. Lord, all these things, all these organizations are, are, are good organizations that seek to glorify you that seek to bring you praise and worship, that seek to to make your name known and famous throughout this world. And yet, Lord God, because of the limitations 
and the prohibitions that are in place right now, uh, many of them are in question. Lord God, many of these things are being planned for, for months, if not years at this point. And yet, Lord God, we know that you are faithful. We know that, that your will will be done, that there is nothing to fear. Lord God, we know that, that if you desire to use these ministries for a certain time, and, and specifically for this time, uh, that you will uphold them. And so, Lord God, would you bless the organizers uh, that, that are in all of these ministries. Lord God, we continue to, to lift up in joy today those who uh, have recovered. Lord God, who have recovered from this disease, who have recovered from other ailments and illnesses. Lord God, we bring them before you and we ask uh, that, that your glory would be lifted up. That, Lord God, as we think about miracles, and it's easy, of course, to read about them in Scripture, uh, and yet, Lord God, each and every healing, uh, whether it seems we can explain it because of medicine and, and surgery and technology, or, Lord God, if we can't explain it, uh, Lord God, you are the one who brings healing into our bodies. Lord God, we give you praise this morning for uh, our, our elders, our seniors in this congregation. As we think about those who are in the care center and in assisted living, Lord God, we ask that you would be near unto them. Uh, but Lord God, also those who uh, are, are shut in, uh, who may be perhaps lonely, uh, Lord God. Uh, we lift them up to you and we lift them up with, with praise, Lord God, because you have been faithful to them. They have not only known you in their own lives, but they have shared you through different ministries in years gone by. They continue to share about you with their families, with their loved ones. Uh, and Lord God, we pray that you would encourage them in these weeks. Lord God, this morning we do. We lift up the GEMS group to you. And we give you thanks for all that this ministry does, not only for the, the girls and the women in our church, but Lord God, for this community. And to see the impact that not only happens in our immediate community, but Lord God, as these girls grow up and, and as they potentially move out of this area, Lord God, there's so much that happens throughout this ministry that you have brought these young women in. You have revealed yourself to them, Lord God, and, and you use them uh, to have a great impact for your kingdom. Lord God, we give you thanks and we bless you for uh, the ministry that was able to happen with them in this year. Lord God, we give you thanks for their leaders and for uh, the families that, that have been connected. Uh, Lord God, we pray that, that all that they learned, all that they worked through, all that they grew in and together, not only with one another, but also with you, Lord God, that you would continue to prosper that. Lord God, we pray for safety. We pray for, uh, again, as we get into the, the summertime months, as we get into uh, the boating and the fishing season this weekend especially, uh, Lord God, we ask that you would grant safety to those who are involved in, in recreation. Uh, Lord God, would you protect them? Would you keep them alert? Would you keep them wise uh, on the, the waters of our area? Uh, Lord God, we pray this day too, uh, that as we dive into your word in a little bit, as we dive into uh, difficult, tragic words, words that bring us to a, a low point, Lord God, that we still would find you, that we would still see how you call us to respond to you, that we would see that which you are doing in this world, even amidst crisis. Uh, and Lord God, that out of that we would find joy. Not joy in ourselves, not joy in our possessions, uh, not a joy that, that fades quickly, uh, but a joy that rests itself in the perfect love of Jesus. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Well, this time I want to. Oh, am I on? I think so. I'll wait for the thumbs up. You good? Okay. So right now I want to talk a little bit to the boys and girls um, that are out there, but also to the GEMS families. Um, this is kind of a sad Sunday, like Pastor Dan had said, that uh, we normally would be filling this church with our GEMS girls and their families, and um, 
today it's just Kenzie and Kaylee and myself uh, along with Dan and Dave today. Um, but we are still going to talk a little bit about our gems and our, our year that we've had. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, I'm kind of going off script because so my girls aren't expecting this, but I just want to say a huge thank you to my GEMS counselors. Um, they are wonderful, and I want to say thank you to the GEMS families. Uh, for one more year, we get to sponsor Milton at the Esther School in Zambia because of your generosity, even with half of our year, part of our year being uh, gone. I'm just so thankful that you've come alongside us and um, continue to sponsor Milton in F at the Esther School. Um, I also want to just reach out and say, our ministry is always looking for people to be a part of it. We need leaders, um, and so if you're feeling led and feeling called, we would love to just have you come and be a part of this ministry. Um, and so I just want to just put that out there, that it would be wonderful to have you. Also, um, part of Gem Sunday, we get to celebrate our eighth graders. Um, it's kind of their graduation from Gems, and this year we had two girls, and their picture is are up on the screen. So we had Reese Hebink and Lainey Klinger, and they are our two eighth grade girls who will be moving on to high school next year. And they've been with us in the GEMS ministry for a really long time, and they have been wonderful leaders. Um, lots of joy and excitement come from them. Um, and one of the special honors that most of the time our eighth grade girls get to do is lead the children's message. And I have to admit that a lot of times in many of the years, the eighth graders wait till the last minute to get this ready. <laughs> but not Reese and Lainey. They have started working on this as soon as we started talking about our loved period theme. And so to the best of our ability, Kenzie and Kaylee and I are going to do their children's message um, the way that they had it planned, uh, even without kids here to be a part of it. So thank you, Reese and Lainey, for all of your work and for uh, the love you've shown. So speaking of loved, what do you think of when you hear the word loved? Maybe you think of your family, your teachers, those of my GEMS girls out there listening. I hope you think about your GEMS counselors and how much we love you. But there is someone who loves us more than any of those people that you're thinking of, and that's God. And we've been saying that verse today, 1 John 3, verse 1, that says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Well, we are going to do a little activity and so I'm going to show you some pictures, and I want you to stand up wherever you're at, and I want you to stand up, and you are going to, when I show you the picture, you're going to jump to this side if you love what I'm showing you a picture of. If it's not something you love and you dislike it, you're going to jump to this side. So I will show you the picture and tell you what it is, and you do the jumping. Ready? First one is balloons. If you love balloons, jump this way. If you don't like balloons so much, jump this way. Okay? Now jump back to the middle. We'll do the next picture. The next one is a picture of vegetables. Do you love vegetables or not like vegetables? Jump back to the middle. Here comes the next one. How about candy? Do you love candy or dislike candy? Okay, back to the middle. Here comes one we see this time of year a lot. How about storms, thunderstorms? Do you love thunderstorms or not so much dislike, do you dislike those thunderstorms? Here's another one. And maybe you're doing a lot more of these right now too while you're home. How about chores? These are all pictures of kids doing their chores. Do you love chores? Jump that way. If you dislike the chores, jump this way. And back to the middle and our very last one. How about family? Do you love family? And hopefully everyone's jumping this way. I'm not even going to say that one. So, great. You can have a seat again. So, the reason we talk about these things, likes, dislikes, the things that you love and don't love, it did not matter which way you jumped for any of those pictures. Because guess what? God's love is always there for you. He loves you no matter, even if you jumped that you disliked the vegetables. He still loves you. God's word does not say, God loves you only if you love vegetables. Or God's word does not say, God only loves you if you are good and kind to your brother and sister. God's love is always for you, and it's a love, period. You are loved, period. So that verse again, 1 John 3, verse 1, says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. 
And there's a big word in the middle of there. It's this word lavished. So I wonder if you know what lavished means. Well, lavished means lots and lots of something, heaped on, generous amounts of something. So rather than just tell you that, we're going to show you what that means. So we're going to pretend that in this bucket, with all this candy, this is God's love. And God's love isn't like this. Here, Kenzie, there's a little bit of God's love. That's not how God's love is. God's love is like this. Here, Kenzie, here's my love. Lavished on top of us. And when we are lavished with God's love, we have so much of it that it's important for us to share it with others as well. So when we think about the love that God gives us, it's important for us as God's people to share that love with others and to find ways that we can do that, even in the middle of our quarantine, that you can show love to your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your neighbors, and even the people you don't see every day. Think of the things that you could do to show that love. So with thinking about all of that love that we have, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love that's lavished on us, that you have given us, that you sent your son, Jesus, to show us what love looks like. And we thank you that we are loved, period, not because of what we do or say, but Lord, because you love us just so very, very much because we're your children. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to show us that love. We thank you, Lord, for Reese and for Lainey and for their years with gems. We thank you for their lives. Pray that you would continue to use them to show your love to others. And as they go off to high school, we thank you for them. And I just ask a special blessing over them. Be with all of the boys and girls, Lord, that they would continue to know how much they are loved by everyone around them, by their parents, by the GEMS counselors, and but especially, Lord, by you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> I just envision the boys and girls trying to jump through their TV screens to, to pick up the candy. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles with me or follow along on the order of service or on the screen uh, with me in Lamentations chapter 3. We're looking at Lamentations 3 verses 1 through 33, uh, and then we're going to jump into chapter 5. Uh, to the end of the chapter, the end of the book, really, uh, in verses 15 through 22. So Lamentations 3 and 5, uh, this forms the basis for our, our final sermon, what is likely our final sermon, in our What Does the Bible Have to Say About COVID-19 series. Uh, and for some of you, I know that there's been issues over the last couple of weeks uh, of being able to watch these televised on the, the Baldwin Cable Network uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, please do remember, if you have access to the internet, uh, that you can find them on the church website uh, or on YouTube. Uh, but also, we're able to provide you with a disc or on a flash drive. Uh, and so if you would benefit from those, please be sure to just contact us here at the church uh, by phone or email, and we will make those available for you. Uh, can we go back to the other slides, Dave, real quick? So we've had this slide up before with all of these questions uh, that people sometimes have about the intersection of crisis and Christian faith. Uh, and I haven't explicitly gone through each and every one of these questions in the last two weeks uh, and given us these simple, precise, short answers, uh, but we've really dealt with a lot of them. Uh, we've looked in recent weeks at how God sent punishments back in the Old Testament. Uh, and when he sent those, he either did so with a warning uh, or as part of the covenant that the people understood what was going on. Uh, we looked ahead last time, and, and that can also include right now at the days leading up to Christ's return. And so we looked at how there's wrath in the Bible talked about. Uh, we placed a, a high stock in this series on God's sovereignty, that not only does God do what he wants just for, for his sake, uh, but God also does things, he wills things, so that people might be drawn to him for salvation. Uh, that's a pretty incredible part of his character. But then we've also considered our own character, our own condition in sin, and, and that when we think about all the harmful things, all the distressing crises in the world, we know that they can be present because of sin and its effects. 
And yet I feel like there's that one main question. It's the first one that I named when we started this series uh, that people always want answers to. That question is, if God can do something, uh, why hasn't he? That's not unique to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's one of those questions I think people have when when they have a loved one who's been in a tragic accident and, and they find themselves in the hospital. It's the question that, that a spouse or, or children might have as they think about their wife or their husband or their parents hospitalized due to a, a significant or chronic ailment. It's a question that can come up when uh, someone is, is all of a sudden noticed to, to be forgetting things and to have dementia or uh, to see the body and, and to see speech and to see memory all of a sudden diminish. But I think it's also the question that when things seem really, really good, whether those are events or or those are relationships, that they are broken apart or they are canceled, that we say, well, why and where is God at? If God is in control, if he is real, why doesn't he do something? And to add to this from the the scriptural point of view, we think about Jesus' own words in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And so which of you, Jesus said, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, though you're a sinner, Jesus says, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So I think about where we're at right now. I think about other times of crises, and we might say, well, God, we've asked you. And so where are you? We're reading from a book today that is sandwiched in the prophets, the book of Lamentations, a book authored by someone who was not afraid to ask God difficult, hard, heartfelt questions. And before we read the first half of chapter 3 and the end of chapter 5, I just want to introduce this to the book by way of uh, what we find in some introduction notes in the ESV Study Bible. As the title indicates, the book of Lamentations is a collection of laments or melancholy dirges for a ruined society. The poems in the book could also be termed elegies or funeral orations in which the author expresses deep personal and communal grief for the dead and for all the suffering that surrounds their loss. Lamentations is not an emotional outburst, but a formal expression of grief in a high literary style. However, each lament moves rapidly from the one topic to the next revealing that the writer's soul is still in turmoil. And so we're happy today. We're experiencing joy on this Gem Sunday, uh, and yet we're going to hear some really sad, depressing, even difficult words. Uh, But again, these things are provided for us for our good. And so let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. 
He has filled me with bitter herbs and sated me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. And so I say my splendor is gone and all that I hope from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke when he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief, to the children of men. Jumping into chapter 5 at verse 15, joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, with jackals prowling over it, You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, back in 2012, uh, the Christian singer-songwriter Matthew West released a song called Do Something. And if you don't know it, it has a a quite inspiring story behind it. Uh, A young woman named Andrea, she was a college student, went over to Uganda, uh, and she was studying abroad. Uh, And and yet she thought, well, I'm just going to go there for the semester, and yet she ended up staying there to help abuse children. She stuck around and she decided that she was going to work with the Ugandan government and she would would open up this new orphanage and she would run this orphanage where all these children would experience love. And Matthew West's song looks at how we deal with that. When we see trouble in the world, when we see pain, when we see distress, maybe we're drawn to ask God, God, why aren't you doing something? Why don't you do something? And Wes pens a response from God that says, I did, I created you. And so the message is that when we see things that disgust us, when we see things that cause people pain, we shouldn't be apathetic and just sit on our hands waiting for something better to happen. But we should do something. We should take initiative. And in many ways, that's really hard to argue with. Because God does call his people to care for others. Again, you think about these passages, James 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And so it's a basic Christian practice that we would put love into action, that we would care about others, that we would not be selfish. In Matthew 7, we return there. Jesus said, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. That that golden rule. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, obviously, Paul intends in that statement the the sense of preaching the gospel, speaking explicitly to the grace of Jesus found in his sacrifice. And yet, when we're talking about ministry and being ambassadors, we are also talking about things that can be actively shown, that we can live out this love that we have. And so I want to begin today in a little bit different spot than than what we're hearing in Lamentations 3 and 5, uh, and, and say, or look at this question, what are you doing? Or what can you be doing in, in times of crisis? As we look at our daily lives, I, I think about how most of us here in Baldwin, Wisconsin, and the surrounding region, uh, we are hoping optimistically that in another three weeks, the COVID-19 precautions and prohibitions would all be removed, or at least that they would be greatly relaxed. Like many places around the world over the last six or so weeks, many of us have had to stay home or, or at least not do as much as we're used to. If you've gone to the grocery store and other places where people gather, maybe you've put on the mask, maybe uh, you, you've stayed away from that and, and you've had your groceries delivered to you. And yet, with all of this going on, we've also seen really encouraging acts of service. Well, people in our congregation, people in our community, we've seen how, how, how they've been making masks, how they've been running errands for each other. We've seen how there's this focus on community, and, and maybe that's prompted us to, to buy more local things or, or to support agriculture or other industries that are really hurting at this time. Some of us have made cards for others or or called those who won't be visited in this time because they're more lonely. There's no doubt, though, that that things are changing right now. We begin to see, again, this nicer weather, and so people are more out and about. Uh, If you follow the news, you know that several states have leaders that are opening things up, uh, and yet there's also those states where people are protesting the government because of their restrictions. And yet when I think about this whole situation, I and anyone else cannot give you a one-size-fits-all answer. That for every single person, this is how it should be, this is how it must be, this is what you should be doing. And yet when we think about this point before us, what are you doing or what can you do in times of crisis? Well, what I'm intending is that we would go back to the values that we find in God's Word that do indeed shape us. And so we have this document that we've been looking at. Our world belongs to God, uh, a contemporary testimony. It talks about life in the world today. Uh, And this is intended to to summarize what the Bible says. How can we apply it to our lives? Uh, And there's this section in that document that is the mission of God's people. And there's a few paragraphs that that really stood out to me, at least, in in times of of crisis, in times uh, especially where it's a a medical crisis. And and so in standing in line with the Christian tradition of being pro-life, paragraphs 44 and 50 state this. Life is a gift from God's hand. God, who created all things, receiving this gift thankfully, with reverence for the Creator, we protest and we resist all that harms, abuses, or diminishes the gift of life. Because it is a sacred trust, we treat all life with awe and respect, especially when it's most vulnerable, whether growing in the womb, touched by disability or disease, or drawing a last breath. When forced to make decisions at life's raw edges, we seek wisdom in community guided by God's word and spirit. Grateful for advances in science and technology, we participate in their development. We welcome discoveries that prevent or cure diseases and that help support healthy lives. And so as each of us thinks about our choices, our actions, our uh, ways that we follow or adhere to guidelines that different leaders have put in place, how are we to value life? Or maybe you call yourself pro-life and you think, well, it's all about uh, not doing things or, or not contributing to that which, which intentionally the, the purpose is to kill. Whether that's abortion or murder or suicide. No, I, I don't do those things. 
And this document reminds us how the, the biblical pro-life stance really broadens out that includes that, that we are not to jeopardize, but rather we're to help protect, we're to, to help those who are alive as we're able. Let's go on in, in the document, though, to paragraphs 52 and 53. We obey God first. We respect the authorities that rule, for they are established by God. We pray for our rulers and we work to influence governments, resisting them only when Christ and conscience demand. We call on all governments to do public justice and to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals, groups, and institutions so that each may do their task. We urge governments and we pledge ourselves to promote the freedom to speak, work, worship, and associate. Maybe you feel what I feel in that, and, and that's a, a tension. That there's certain statements in that that, that that make me think, oh, it's being written by people who lean one way politically, and, and yet then there's other things that I say, no, it, it's people who feel that way, who feel that tendency towards a, a different political party, a different political ideology. And, and yet this document, again, a, a contemporary testimony, captures a well-rounded look at how we are to respect our government's decisions. Even when we have politicians we don't like, even when they do things that we disagree with us, it, it reminds us that to be Christian cannot fit perfectly or even nicely into a single political outlook. But as we're reflecting all this, I, I want us to think about how uh, here we have COVID-19, here we have all the effects of the pandemic, and they really do bring us to a point of, of wondering, well, what does God want me to do? What does he want us to do? And we've covered a lot in the past couple of weeks. Again, we've, we've covered about repentance. We've covered uh, about trusting God. But also, uh, I would add today that we are called to love others well. That is our calling. It's not just to fight for our rights. It's not just to fight for certain policies that, that please us. But we are to love the healthy. We're to love the sick. We're to love the vulnerable. We're to love the government leaders because they are people. They are our neighbors that we like and don't like and that we might go back and forth with. We're to love our, our farmers. We're to love our meat processors. We're to love our gardeners and those who bring us food. We're to love our hospital workers, to love our scientists, to love our custodians. It's easy, I, I say that for myself, it's easy for me to get frustrated about what I can't do in this time, where I can't go. And yet part of our pursuit as Christians in times of crisis is to live selflessly, is to live loving others, which is an expression of gratitude to God. And so there are certainly things that, as the song said, we can do something about, and yet we must remember that God is not disconnected from this world. That he's not deaf or, or blind to our pleas and prayers, that there's not a, a poor service or a poor connection between us and God. God's hands are not tied so that he can't do anything. But thinking about the gems theme, I I wonder, if God loves us, how do we understand him when we have pain and suffering, when we're experiencing poverty, or when life just seems upside down? How do we understand God? And the simplest answer I can find to that question is this. In his love, God welcomes our lament. One of the most difficult things, I think, for Christians, but just for people in general, really is being honest uh, about difficult things. Being willing to share when we don't feel okay. We find it difficult to uh, express things when we're in distress. We, we find it difficult to talk when, when we really don't understand what God is doing. When it feels like he's not maybe on our side. And so I think we, in our, our, our attempt to be honest, we, we find ourselves glossing over the hardships of our lives. We, we try to fix or we expect a fix from someone if we're going to share something with them. We assume that we always have to put on a happy face or, or we think, well, just because someone has it way worse than I do, 
uh, that, that I guess, well, it's not really that big of a deal what I'm dealing with. And yet I also think about how big of a deal the, the prosperity gospel has become. That certain pastors have, have developed this preaching over time that is all about health and wealth if you do just the right things. And they bring out this message that God would not at all have people suffer. And while that feels good, it, it does, it misses the mark on the reality that there are trials, there are hardships in our lives. If you experience poverty or, or persecution, it's not necessarily because you've been disobedient to God. Well, honesty isn't just needed in our person-to-person -person conversations and relationships, but, but we can also share and, and take all of this, we should take all of this, to God in prayer. If you look back in, in Lamentations 3, all the times that the author uses the word he, it's referring to God. If you go back to chapter 1, Lamentations 1, you can see that this was written around the time when God's people were being invaded. When enemies came and, and broke down their cities, those who, who, who left had been carried off, they knew that their homeland was destroyed. Those who were left behind, they were surrounded by devastation. And yet he, the author is not just talking about what he can see, what he can touch, but he's also sort of feeling that God had destroyed everything in them and for them as well. How deep the pain must be when in chapter 3, verse 16, he says, He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. On one hand, I'm guessing that for most of us, we wouldn't say that uh, the, the pain, the anguish of the last six weeks uh, has, has mounted to that point. We don't feel like we've had our, our teeth crushed into gravel. And yet, maybe for some of us, it, it has. I, I don't want to say that, that that's not possible. Perhaps this is a, a terrible, a horrible time for you. Your, your livelihood is on the rocks. You're struggling to make it financially. Perhaps your relationships, either with your parents or with your kids or, or with your spouse, they're in turmoil. Maybe you feel like, like the burden of all this, the burden of life is just so great upon you that it's causing depression, it's causing thoughts of, of wanting just to leave this all behind. Maybe it feels like God has deserted you, that he has forsaken you, that he has removed himself from you. If that's your situation, then I want to encourage you to, to share that with him to ask God to make his love visible and tangible in your life. Maybe don't bro bring that burden to God alone, but, but share it with a friend, share it with a brother or sister in the faith, and, and that if they will listen to you, that they might also uphold you. But brothers and sisters, I, I want to make clear the same message that, that Jen shared earlier. God does love us. His love is so deep, it is so secure, that, that, that we can confess every struggle that we have to him. And we do get to hold on to the promise that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. He will not. The writer of Lamentations, he might have felt like, like that was the case. In chapter 5, verse 20, we heard those words, Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us for so long? And yet we know that, that all of this, all of these laments in this book, whether they were written down, whether they were yelled, whether they were cried out to God, they came from someone who still believed in God. Someone who knew they were still in his hands. And so I do think they come with the understanding that we find in question and answer 28 of the Heidelberg Catechism. How does the knowledge, or we, I think, can add, how does the faith in God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love. If you want to hear more about that last part, go ahead and, and look up Romans 8. The whole chapter is just a beautiful testimony that, that nothing can separate us. Of what God has done in adopting us as his sons and daughters. 
When I think about that very first claim, we can be patient when things go against us. And, and, and patience, I, it doesn't necessarily have to be all about sort of this peaceful calm. But I think we can have a, a patience in understanding that there is a, a trust that there is something more. And so what's coming through in Lamentations 3 and the rest of this book comes from a place, again, of, of knowing God, of knowing his authority, and, and yet because we know and believe in God, what, when hard things happen, when crisis strikes, when loved ones die, when friends let us down, we know that there is no one greater to turn to than God himself. He is there. He will listen to you. He will continue to speak from his word and, and through the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And that's what brings us into our final point then today. God has daily mercies and forever restoration in store. God has daily mercies and forever restoration in store. Here are the beautiful words again that come out of chapters 3 and 5. Chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord, he, the Lord, is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And then in chapter 5, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. There is hope, brothers and sisters, whether we will recognize it today, uh, whether we recognize it in three weeks, when we recognize it when uh, all this finally is over and things get reopened and, and social distancing becomes a thing of the past and when we can shake hands, we can give hugs. There is hope. Whether we think about it in the future or we experience it right now, there is hope that what we experience in, in every crisis and every hardship that God is still with us by his love that he is showing mercy daily and forever and when I say that I, I don't say that to gloss over I don't say that to minimize painful times but but we have to recognize if we are God's children if we recognize and, and believe he loves us that even in the midst of painful times not everything is painful. And so what is the love of God that, that the author of Lamentations all about? Particularly in times of trouble, what is the love that comes through in verses 22 and 32? Well, there's this Hebrew word, hesed. And, and hesed can be translated to be a, a covenant love, a steadfast love, an unfailing love. And, and this is what Professor John McKay writes in, in his commentary. Hesed denotes the quality of the relationship between two parties as being one of goodwill and mutual concern by which a favorable inner disposition reveals itself in practical acts of assistance and support for the other party. This frame of mind and its complementary actions are not one-off displays of kindness, but they constitute an enduring bond of fidelity. The Hesed relationship may be initiated by the action of one party, but it inherently requires a reciprocal response. That might be going right over your head and you say, wow, there was just too much there. I kind of faded out. And yet I want us to think just about that last part. Hesed constitutes an enduring bond of fidelity initiated by the action of one party, but it inherently requires a reciprocal response. That, that we consider faith in not just a God, but the God of the Christian faith, the God who put on flesh, who came into this world, who endured tragic suffering on our behalf, speaks to the love that God has for us. It's a love that, that he gave first. It's not that we love him, it's that he loved us. And so difficult things may be happening right now, and they may continue to affect us at other points in our lives, but they will never erase the love 
that God has shown to us in the past and what his love has accomplished for the future. Let me say that again. Difficult things may happen right now and they may continue to affect us throughout our lives, and yet they never erase the love that God has had for us, that he's shown in the past, and that he's accomplished for the future. And so again, we hold on to the understanding that, that sickness and shortness of breath and fatigue and fevers and death, they are all in this world because of sin. God didn't decide, well, hey, I, I think it'd be great, I think it'd be quite peachy just if, if X number of people got sick with this virus. It's not how God operates. No, but we do know that he is doing something even when we're in the middle of everything, even when we can't readily see it, we live by faith. That God gives us new mercies each and every day, that, that he is preparing us, he's giving us a glimpse of what is to come. Maybe the mercy is even helping us understand that, that something like this virus will never be in his kingdom. It can't be in his kingdom. And so we end our series with this. Where is God? Well, he's still with us. What is he doing? He's hearing the cries and laments, the groaning of this world that has experienced the pain of life astray from him. And yet he continues to show mercies. If we've given our lives to him, we can know that we will one day be with him. Our identity, our comfort, our destiny are secure because God loves us, period. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, as we look back in history, uh, over all the evils that have been done, over all sinful people, as we look at acts of revenge, acts of hatred, acts of selfishness, as we look at diseases and plagues, as we look at how different people decided things and, and the choices that they made, and uh, Lord God, it, it meant harm against others. Uh, Lord, it, it's hard to comprehend why you allow this all to just keep on going. It's hard to understand why don't you safeguard us? Why don't you rescue us? Why don't you put an end quickly to the disease? Lord, we sit in silence because there isn't an easy answer there. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Indeed, our thoughts can't even fathom how you do this. And let, Lord God, you've given us enough. You have told us that you love us. You've told us that you've done enough, that you have satisfied all that is enough to bring us reconciliation, to bring us redemption, to bring us restoration. God, we, we pray this morning with a view on crisis, with a view throughout history uh, that doesn't just seek restoration, meaning the healing from this disease. And we don't pray restoration just asking for our, our towns and our counties and our nations and our world, Lord God, that, that, that that which has fallen would be able to be rebuilt and have its prior standing. But Lord God, we're looking forward to a restoration that is as you intended in the Garden of Eden. We're looking forward to the restoration to that which you desired in a relationship of love, a relationship in which you could walk among us, a relationship in which we had perfect love for you. Lord God, remake us. Continue to sanctify us and transform us into perfect children into perfect sons and daughters. Through the image, through the death, through the resurrection and the joy of the ascension of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, do not forsake us. All this we pray in your Son's precious name. Amen.
Again, so much of what I've preached about this morning brings us back to faith. What is the core of our faith? And so I want to give us the opportunity this morning to, uh, to confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Uh, again, I know it's not the one that is most familiar, uh, and so please do follow along either on the screen or uh, you can follow along on your order of worship. But let's profess together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And so with that confession of faith, we also praise our God as we turn to him in song once more, as our ladies come back up, uh, and they're going to lead us in love the Lord and behold our God.